Um, so I'll be talking about uh, home and continuing care, the home care and nursing home uh, sectors in my uh, presentation. Um, they're interesting because in many ways they've um, come to be on the forefront of electronic health records in, in Canada, even though they have very low funding levels uh, compared to other parts of the health system. They, there's actually been a real information revolution in, in the sector. Uh, so my presentation is going to be a bit of a uh, back to the future uh, presentation to frame this. I'll, I'll uh, start with um, uh, this book. Um, it was part of something called the Butterworth Series on Individual and Population Aging. And this series of manuscripts or books uh, was published in the mid-1980s to um, uh, 1991, and there were about 15 uh, books overall published by the leading gerontologist um, in the country uh, at the time. Um, and so it was in many ways regarded as gerontology's coming of age in, in Canada. Uh, this gentleman, Bill Forbes, uh, was the founding president of the Canadian Association on Gerontology, the founding president of the Ontario Gerontology Association, and founding vice president of the Gerontological Society of America, and he was also my PhD supervisor. So while he was working on this book, uh, I was one of his graduate students and have, have a signed copy um, uh, of his book. Um, uh, Bill passed away in around uh, 2000, um, but on the 25th anniversary of the, the launch of that series, the um, Canadian Journal on Aging decided to do a special issue uh, looking to see what happened in the last 25 years, and I was fortunate enough to be invited to uh, do the article to update uh, Bill's book. Now, it's kind of hard to think about how do you take a 150-page um, a book and then cover um, uh, 25 years' worth of research uh, in an article that should be around uh, 5,000 words. And I thought to keep it simple, I would look at at uh, what he described in terms of uh, health information systems at the time and what he saw for the future. And what was striking is that there were no national data for the nursing home sector uh, available other than age and sex. Um, and Bill was a statistician, a former dean of math. Uh, by all accounts, he, he would describe himself as a data hound. Every time a data set became available, he would be the first one to have it. And all he could do in his book on institutionalization was to cite small uh, localized uh, studies. And I'll show you an example of that later on. And in their book, talking about the future of the nursing home sector, they said, we really need to have a national standardized assessment system. But they said it's probably not going to be feasible because to do that, you'd have to have computers in nursing homes, and we know that's not going to happen. Uh, now, those are also around the time the IBM PC had just come out, and Bill Gates said nobody would need more than 64K of, of memory and, and so on. But what was interesting is because they didn't have um, the notion of having a standardized clinical assessment system available, it very much limited the, the author's framework of, uh, of thinking about quality and long-term care to mainly thinking about survey-based methodologies where you would send out a survey to residents in long-term care, ask them if it's a nice place, if the food is good, in many ways similar to our, our, our uh, patient experience surveys uh, today. But that's as far as it could uh, get. They didn't think about quality indicators that could look at clinical outcomes over time or risk adjustment methodologies to, to um, compensate for, for population uh, differences. So their ideas about what was possible in quality were limited, were limited by the, um, the nature of the data sets uh, that they had on, on hand. The other thing is that they were really quite concerned about how good the information systems were for the home care side because there was a concern that people were being placed prematurely into long-term care. Well, now, 25 years later, if we look at where we are in Canada, we have the large-scale implementation of, in, in our country of the Inter-Eye family of assessment instruments. These are comprehensive clinical assessments done at the point of care by trained health professionals as part of their day-to-day -day clinical assessment uh, practices. They're done purposely to uh, develop care plans for individuals to track outcomes over time, and they can be repurposed for, for many other purposes. The data are standardized. We have about uh, a dozen licensed vendors in Canada that sell software to support this. Many of them uh, have displays um, uh, in the, um, uh, the exhibit booth here uh, for that. And there's very little text uh, data in it. Most are based on, on scientifically validated uh, measures of, of 
uh, broad-based uh, clinical characteristics. And I would say that for the most part, the data quality of these data are good um, uh, to, to very good in, in, in many cases. As, as you can see, this family of instruments covers a very broad spectrum of the continuum of care. So wherever there are complicated people in the Canadian healthcare system, we have a measurement system available for them. And by complicated, I would refer to older people, people with mental illness, people who are dying, medically fragile children. We have solutions that can be used to assess the needs of these individuals. So this shows roughly where we are today in terms of the Canadian implementation uh, of these instruments. So when it's a solid icon like that, it means that the government has mandated or strongly recommended its implementation, and the hollow icons are pilot or demonstration projects. And so you can see that our nursing home instrument, the REI 2.0, and our home care instrument, the RIHC, have in fact become the national standards for those sectors, uh, pretty much covering the, the entire country. And we're now even beginning with our mental health instruments to have pilot projects in, in Quebec, which I'm not sure many of us have, would have anticipated uh, seeing that kind of change uh, happening in, in our country. A critical partner in this for the inter -I research group that I belong to has been CAIHI because uh, I think we've worked out a system in Canada that uh, many folks internationally are jealous of where we have a strong research network through the inter -I, uh, group working with a, uh, a major national partner uh, where CAIHI supports three reporting systems for our nursing home, home care and mental health instruments. The data go into those reporting systems. They can be used for national statistical reporting. They go back to individual organizations and we can also use them for research purposes uh, to, to use these data for a lot of very interesting uh, questions uh, about our, our population. So when you look at Bill's book, this is the only table uh, that has data other than age and sex in the entire 150 pages uh, in it. It's a single um, uh, table on uh, activities of daily living in one uh, part of Saskatchewan from a study done six years earlier uh, by a, a colleague who's actually my next door neighbor at the University of Waterloo now, uh, Paul Stoley. So uh, add up those ends in the bottom and you end up with roughly 700 cases. Where we are as of the end of 2013 is we're in 10 provinces and territories in the country. About 600,000 assessments are added to the database uh, each year. There's been a million and a half Canadians in these three sectors, nursing home, home care and mental health, uh, already assessed. Uh, and, and that accounts for over 5 million assessments. And this doesn't include data yet from provinces like Alberta who've just begun uh, to, su to submit these data. So we've gone from having virtually no data to actually having lots of, of big data. These databases are large not just because uh, there's substantial volumes, but each assessment has around 350 clinical variables describing the characteristics uh, of the person in them. But uh, Bill also had a sign on his door quoting this gentleman, uh, the, and, the, and the quote was, data, data everywhere, but not a thought to think, and it was by Theodore Rozak, who uh, coined the term counterculture. And there's a, a YouTube video available, I'd encourage you to um, uh, listen to it, because it begins, it, it's, uh, it's very interesting. And Rozak's basic argument is that um, data aren't enough. Um, that big data are not enough to transform the healthcare system. He wasn't talking about healthcare when he when he made that quote um, several decades ago. Um, but we should probably stop talking about big data, uh, he would argue, and instead start to think about big ideas that we can test with solid methodologies. So data in and of themselves won't answer anything for you. You can have you know, tens of millions of bad data points and it won't help you um, address the policy question. You need to frame it in terms of things that you want to be able to do and use good methodologies with good data to, to test the interventions you want to use to address those big ideas. So I've got two examples of big ideas that have been in the gerontological literature forever that we've been able to um, address in the Canadian context because of, of the kind of information that we have available to us. Um, so the first idea is that we should keep older people out of nursing homes. So think about yourselves, you know, think about your, your goals in life. Is one of the things that, that's part of your goal in life to end up in a nursing home? Probably not. It's not a goal for anybody uh, to end up uh, in a nursing home. So how can we get to that point of having fewer people in nursing homes? Well, this graph is one that I've built over time with data from these implementations as well as pilot projects. It shows um, the cognitive performance scale, which is a measure of cognitive impairment, 
going from zero to cognitively intact to six to very severely cognitively impaired, and it shows the distribution of that characteristic across the continuum of care, starting with um, palliative care, home care, community support services, uh, acute hospital settings for the frail elderly, various psychiatric um, uh, hospital um, uh, settings, community mental health settings, uh, nursing homes, and complex continuing care hospitals. And what you see is that in community settings, most people are cognitively intact to mildly cognitively impaired. And in institutional settings, you tend to see people more cognitively impaired. So community intact, institution more cognitively impaired. It kind of makes sense if you think about what the uh, shape of a healthcare system uh, should be. But then what are these people who are cognitively intact doing in a nursing home or a complex continuing care hospital? Now that we have evidence about what the shape of the system looks like, we may be able to reshape it a bit more to keep some of those people uh, in the community. So one of the decision support tools that we um, created that you, you get uh, in terms of instant feedback once you've done uh, the RI home care assessment is a, an algorithm called the, the MAPLE system. Uh, you know, gratuitous nationalism is part of acronym uh, development, so um, we made sure that it had a, a good kind of Canadian image uh, attached to it. But basically it differentiates people based on ADL impairment, cognitive impairment, behavioral issues, falls, um, uh, pressure ulcers, all the big variables you would think of in terms of, of geriatric uh, medicine, and it differentiates people into low-risk groups to very high-risk groups in terms of things like caregiver distress, nursing home placement, um, and, and um, uh, consumption of informal care time. If we look across different regions of Ontario and look at nursing home admission rates by people who are in the low to moderate ranges of that algorithm, what you see is the rates of nursing home placement is somewhere between 20 and 25 percent. One region is very high. Well, Ontario put in place a number of different strategies, including a home first strategy to reduce uh, nursing home admissions from hospital, uh, increased resources in, in home care, with the aim of helping people to stay in the community longer. And here's what, what happened over time. In every region, within about a year and a half time frame, there was a reduction in the proportion of people with low to moderate care needs being admitted to a nursing home. So the rates of premature admissions dropped precipitously, um, including in that one one region that used to be an outlier was more uh, consistent with, with the rest of the province. So by all counts, gerontologists should be doing victory laps around the country because we said we want to keep people out of nursing homes and here was an information tool that helped to achieve uh, a policy objective and demonstrated uh, that it worked. Um, but we also have to think about unintended, unintended consequences of policy changes that we make. So we did a report for Health Council of Canada looking at the experience of caregivers in Canada. And one of the things that we saw is that when, irrespective of the region that we were looking at, when we look at the amount of time of care that people get uh, with care needs, the green is family time and blue is formal pay time by the home care system, three quarters of the care people get comes from family members. So the health care system actually only contributes a fairly small portion of supports uh, to home care clients. And if we look at patterns of care over time, as we go from the low maple levels to the very high maple levels, and look at the average hours of care that people are getting, the higher the maple level, the more care time is being provided. Nova Scotia is a bit of an outlier in terms of it really jumping up. But by the time you're into that very high maple level, um, what you're seeing is that some family members are, are providing care that's the equivalent to a full-time job. So what does the paid system do in terms of response to that? The, the, the y-axis is, is not going to change here, so the, all the scales are the same. That's what the paid system looks like, informal care, formal care. And so there is some increment in formal care being provided, but not nearly on the slope that you see the, um, in terms of family members. And not surprisingly, the higher the rates of, uh, or the higher the maple levels, the higher the rates of caregiver distress. So one of the unanticipated consequences that we saw with this policy of pe keeping people in the community longer is we saw an increase in the prevalence rates of caregiver distress because family members are having to do a lot more with people that used to go to institutional settings but now they're in the community where they provide three quarters of, of, of the care. The second big idea is, well, if people have to be in nursing homes, let's make them better. So I'm going to show you a couple of quality improvement um, uh, initiatives that address two important quality issues in the nursing home uh, setting. Um, 
Uh, this was a, a report that we just did for the OECD looking at quality of care in, in long-term care settings. This, um, uh, it, uh, this book, uh, A Good Life in Old Age, is available uh, online. And what this shows is reductions in restraint use in Canada in different provinces after they began implementing our nursing home instrument. This was Ontario where we had a 30% rate of restraint use. When we first published that with CAIHI, there were shock waves through the province because we realized that our rates of restraint use were much higher uh, than just about any other jurisdiction in the world that we compare them with. And what you see consistently is province by province that restraint use started to, to be reduced uh, over time as these measurement systems started to be put in place. Recently, the Toronto Star had a, 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 a report on problems related to antipsychotic use in, uh, in nursing home settings. They felt the need to do an investigative report by reporters. They could have saved themselves a lot of money because CHI actually publishes data on rates of antipsychotic use uh, nationally uh, using a quality indicator developed by InterI that's very carefully risk-adjusted and targeted at, at um, inappropriate use of, of antipsychotics. And what you see is that the rates are around 30%, but there's tremendous variability between facilities and there are variations between provinces that are of interest um, uh, as well. And in fact, if you take a look at Ontario's pattern, there was a bit of a bump up and then falling down, but the Winnipeg Regional Health Authorities had the steady decline in uh, rates of, of antipsychotic use where it's not uh, justified. And so people said, well, what's going on in, in Winnipeg? Um, it's not the world, the most pro, um, uh, prosperous part of, of um, uh, Canada. So, you know, is it that they have higher staffing levels in their nursing homes? No. Is it that they have much higher um, uh, fancy uh, new nursing homes? Not the case at all. Do they have a psychogeriatrician on staff in every nursing home? No, that's not what's going on. In fact, they used the evidence from the interi assessment to target this as a quality improvement uh, initiative, put in place the resources, and drove uh, the rates down. And they're, they're now regarded as national leaders as part of a Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement Initiative to disseminate what they learned on antipsychotic reduction in their homes uh, across the country. So what have we learned since uh, Bill wrote his uh, book when I was a graduate student? Well, first of all, that by investing in integrated health information systems, we really can respond uh, to at least some of the challenges uh, related to population aging. Um, second is that we can undergo transformational change in, in healthcare when we have good uh, evidence available. Those changes that you saw in, in antipsychotic use and restraint use are massive changes that make a big difference on, on people's lives. And so you can test big ideas when you have good quality data and good analytic uh, techniques. And that if we think about simple policy solutions for complicated problems, we also have to be ready for the uninti unintended consequences of those simple solutions. But even there, if we have good evidence systems uh, in place, we can address those unanticipated consequences through an evidence-informed dialogue. Thank you.